I'm glad to be here. Man, what a great Sunday. Uh, anybody get any rain yesterday? Man, we got three inches at the house. That's awesome, but uh, it's been, been blessed. But, hey, we're glad you're here this morning. I've, I've talked to a few people their first time here today, and uh, we, we welcome you here to our family. Um, in case you hadn't found out, we're a little different out here, pretty laid back. Um, but we, we welcome you here this morning, and uh, it is a family. It's not a church, guys, so we're glad you're here to worship with us this morning. But uh, if you're here for the first time or hadn't been here in a while, um, we started a series a couple of weeks ago called Dare to Obey, and, and it came about because, man, in our culture, when somebody says, I dare you, that's the same as hold my beer. <laughs> that's a bad deal. It, it, it goes south in a hurry. When somebody says, I dare you. So a couple of weeks ago, I, I started, I said, guys, I dare you to obey Jesus Christ. And we started this series, and, and of course, the first thing we looked at, David, that sounds a little bit hot to me. Is it loud to y'all? It's a little bit hot. So uh, we started this series about daring to obey, and, and we started the first part is to know God's word. Because it's impossible to, buy, to obey any law. It's impossible to obey something if you don't know what you're supposed to obey. Now, they tell us that in the state of Texas, they say ignorance of the law is no excuse for not obeying the law. I beg to differ with them. There are some things I'm just ignorant about on that. But, but reality is, is we have to know the law. We have to know God's word. We have to know what Jesus expects of us before we can become obedient. And then I used a story uh, about Arabian horses, and we'll talk about those again today, but it, it's one thing to know the law. It's another thing to understand what God's Word says. So we looked at the second part on Dare to Obey was to understand what God's Word says to us. Knowing and understanding is great, but unfortunately there's a lot of people in our country, a lot of people in our Word that they know God's Word, they understand God's Word, but they're still not obeying because the key and most important part to obedience is submitting to the law. I've used this story about the Arabians. I talked about a guy that does these long-distance uh, races, especially over in the Middle East. They have these endurance races, and, and Arabians are just suited for that. And Mustangs, Jeremy. I don't want you to be offended there. But uh, he'll doggo. He's all, you know, that. some of you have seen that movie. But... But he trained these Arabians for these endurance races. And, and one of the things he does as he's training them is because that race is so long and because they're in such remote area, is that horse is so important to the life of the rider. If they get bucked off or failed off like I do a lot of times and that horse runs away, it's not obedient to that rider. They're stranded in the middle of the desert. They're stranded out there and they'll die. So he trains these horses for obedience, and, and he, he trains them with a whistle. And the, the story I used is at the end of that training, he, he pins these horses up, and he makes them go without water for an extended period of time. It doesn't say how long, but he makes them go a long time without water. And, and part of that is part of their training, because in the desert it's going to be hard to get to water, but the other part of it is to show that that horse is obedient. And he takes them off water and feed, but then he opens the gate and sends them to where in a lot where the water is, and he trains them with a whistle, and then he, he blows that whistle, and the ones that are completely trained, that are obeying, they stop before they ever get to the water, and they come back to the trainer. It's one thing to know what the trainer's expecting. It's another thing to understand that that whistle, when he blows it, is he's saying, guys, stop, I want you to come back to me. But it is a whole different thing to be obedient and to submit to that. I use that example. Can you imagine, I'm sure most of you in this building cannot imagine this, myself included. Can you imagine going three days without food? I can't. Not going to happen. It's going to be a bad situation. But can you imagine going two or three days without food and water, and then all of a sudden... Kirby calls you, and he says, man, I've got this ribeye, and it's ready, and boy, it's good, and the potato, and the tea, and everything there, and he sets it on the table, and you're hungry. I mean, you had not eaten in three days, and you get right up to the table with a knife and a fork, and you're drooling, and you're shaking a little bit, and he says, just kidding. 
somebody's going to get whooped. <laughs> right? That's the way these horses were. They, they, they stopped and they went back because they were submissive. They submitted to them. The world we live in, man, we, we know the speed limit. We understand the laws in the state of Texas that if there is a white sign on the road and it has 55 or 70 or 35 or whatever, you know that that is the limit that you can drive. We understand the consequences if you don't obey that speed limit, right? But in order to truly be obedient, we have to submit. That means you accelerate, you mash on the gas till you get up to that desired speed limit, posted speed limit, and then you back off of the gas to maintain that speed limit. We become, guys are looking at me like, that's not what I do. I mash on it harder, boys. Yeah. But if we're going to be obedient to God's word, we not only have to know God's word, we not only have to understand God's word, we have to submit to God's word. There's a story in the Old Testament about a man named King Saul. Story in the Old Testament about King Saul. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 15, and I'm going to jump around a little bit. I gave Bruce a couple of verses to put up there, but I'm going to, before we get to those, I'm going to read some others. But I want to read this quote to you. If, if you're in here and you're over the age of 50, you may remember this guy, especially if you grew up in the Baptist church. His name is Jerry Bridges. Jerry Bridges was part of the Navigators. Anybody ever go through the Navigator series? If you say you did, you're going to admit your age in here. The Navigator series was, was kind of a Bible study deal that came out in the 70s and 80s and all that, but, but Jerry was a very educated man, and Jerry has this quote. He says, Above all else, we must learn how to bring our wills into submission and obedience to the will of God on a practical, daily, and hour-by-hour -hour basis. As we look at this story in 1 Samuel, let me give you a little background here. The Lord had, had appointed through had appointed King Saul uh, through Samuel. Samuel uh, spoke to the Lord, and the Lord spoke to Samuel, and he said, you go to this man named Saul, and you appoint him as king. And, and then constantly the Lord is speaking to Samuel, and he's giving direction to Saul. And where our story picks up is in chapter 15, and it talks about Saul destroying the Amalekites. In verse 3, I'm going to paraphrase this deal because it's a long passage. It says, now listen to this message from the Lord. This is Samuel speaking. And he talks to Saul and he says, Now go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation, men, women, children, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. So Saul mobilized his army, and there were 200,000 soldiers in Israel. So Saul and his guys go, and they get there, and then we jump down to verse 7. It says, Then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur. East of the Egypt, he captured Agog, who was the king of the Amalekites, but completely destroyed everyone else. Saul and his men spared Agog's life and kept the best of the sheep and the goats, the cattle, the fat calves, the lambs, everything that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. We jump down to verse 10, and it says, The Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me, and he has refused to obey my command. Samuel was deeply moved when he heard this, and then he cried out to the Lord all night. If you keep reading in that story before we get to verse 20, you're going to see that Saul does exactly what we do. He, Samuel has come, and he's whooped up on him. And he says, Guy, he says, dude, you haven't been obedient to what God's called you to do. You knew what you were supposed to do. You understand what God said, but you didn't submit to what God said. And then Saul does what we do all the time is he starts making excuses. He says, but I destroyed everything, and I kept the best for God. I kept the best for God, and I destroyed all that worthless stuff. But he still wasn't obedient to what God had called him to do. When we get down to verse 20, Samuel is talking to Saul. He says, but the Lord, but did, but I did, this is Saul, but I did, the, I did obey the Lord. Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agog, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought in all the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle. But Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, or your obedience to his voice? 
Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft, and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. God, I pray that, uh, God, you would just open our eyes that, that we would dare to be obedient. God, in every aspect of our life, Father, you've given us your word. You steal us your word. You help us to understand your word. And God, what you're asking us today is to submit to your word. So Father, I pray that today would be a day of revelation. Today would be a day that we could start over and start being obedient to what you've called us to do. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, as I read this story, I, man, I think about the world we live in today. And, and there's all kinds of advertisements out there. I, I'll age myself a little bit. Anybody remember Burger King's ad that came out years ago? What set Burger King apart from McDonald's and all that stuff? They had a slogan. Have it your way. Have it your way. Then Nike comes out with a, an ad that says, just do it. Now we've got Red Bull and Monster, and Red Bull says it'll give you wings meaning you can fly wherever you want to go. I've seen some of those guys that are hitting those Red Bulls pretty good. They're flying. Now, now we've got Monster, and it says, Unleash the Beast. And Unleash the Beast says, Man, you drink this stuff, and, and you can, you'll have energy to do what you want to do and do how you want to do it. You see, we live in a world that says, Man, it is okay for you to just do what you want to do and what makes you comfortable. As I read this story, the part that stood out is in verse um, 9. And it says, Saul said, everything that appealed to them is what they kept. How many times in life do we know God's word, we understand God's word, and we're willing to submit parts of our life to God's word, but then we stop and say, whoa, 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 whoa. That part of my life appeals to me. I don't really care what God's Word says about it because that part makes me feel good. We're willing to submit to God until we get to that part that we say, whoa, now you're just meddling, God. Now, now you're interfering with what appeals to me. We hang on to what appeals to us. Again, the quote from Jerry Bridges, above else, we must learn how to bring our will into submission and obedience to the will of God on a practical, daily, hour-by-hour -hour basis. I visit with people all the time. Man, they, they, are, they are struggling with different things. And this is one of the first things I say, well, that's how God made me. That's how God designed me. And, and, and they understand God's Word, and they understand the things that they're doing, the lifestyles they've chosen, the addictions that have controlled them, and they say, man, I, I can't get over it. I, I talked to one guy one time. This guy will go off in a second. I mean, he'll cuss and scream and holler. And he says, man, I can't help it. It's just my temper. That's the way God made me. You know, when we say those words and we know God's word and we understand God's word and you say, man, I can't change what I'm doing, even though I know God's word says different because this is the way God made me. You know what we're saying in that essence? We're saying God messed up. We're saying when God said, I created man in my image, and I created man to be holy, and then when God says, man shall not do this and that, but man should do this and that, and we say, you know what, I can't help that because that's the way God made me. You're basically saying, well, God just messed up on me. Guys, God doesn't make junk. Nowhere in the scripture does it say God created most men and most women in his image, but there's a few of them that he created that are just jacked up. It doesn't say that. It says that every one of us are created in his image. And his plan is for us to be obedient to him and to submit to him. And it says sometimes that goes against what makes us feel good or makes us think that we're something that we're really not. I don't get sometimes people struggle because they say, man, this is the way God made me. And then they turn right around and say, man, I believe God's word, Genesis to Revelations. 
then you don't believe the most important part. That God knew you before you were ever born. God knew you before you were ever a twinkle in your mom and daddy's eye. God had a purpose and a plan for your life. He says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans for you to prosper and not fail. To have a future and a hope. You see, when we say, I can't help it, God just made me this way, then we're saying that God created junk. And guys, God doesn't create junk. But God does ask that we be obedient to him. That not only do we know him, we understand him, but we come to a point where we submit to him. So how do we obey God? By submitting. You see, I believe the devil has convinced every one of us in here that there are parts of our lives that we just don't need to submit to God. And I can tell you as a pastor, as a, a man that's been saved for years, it is a daily struggle to submit to what God wants us to do. It is a daily struggle to get up in the morning and know that you have to deal with some crazy people and know that you have to submit to God because the flesh wants to go grab them by the ears and bang their head against the wall. It is a daily struggle sometimes for people to get up in the morning knowing that they have an addiction or something that, that is just so in, in consume their world that they have to get up in the morning and say, God, today I've just got to give it to you. We struggle with that. We struggle with the submission. And Satan has convinced us how to live outside of the submitting to God and how to live outside of obedience by saying, surely God didn't mean what he said. If we go back to the book of Genesis, the very thing that, that caused mankind to stum was that word surely from Satan when he looked at Eve and he said, surely God didn't say you would die? Surely. And Eve listened to him. And Adam listened to him and said, huh, maybe God was confused when he said that. He really didn't know what he meant. Guys, God is perfect. And God's word is infallible. It means it does not change. From the very beginning, he created us to have a relationship with him, to know him, to understand him, and then to be obedient to him. So how do we obey? If you've got your Bibles, again, we're going to turn and look at the New Testament in James chapter 4. James chapter 4 will also be in, in 1 Peter chapter 5. But James chapter 4, James titles this passage in, in my Bible, it's titled Drawing Close to God. Drawing Close to God, because when we draw close to God, I believe that's how we become obedient. If you're not around somebody or something, anybody in here ever trained a dog? Yeah, I, I've attempted to. I've got one success story and one failure. One, one of them's, he's terrible. You cannot train that animal. Maybe it was a horse or something. You cannot train that animal unless you spend time with that animal. That animal cannot become obedient to what you desire in the training unless that animal is involved with you and connected with you. Guys, we can't become obedient to God if we don't draw close to him. James chapter 4 James writes these words. He says, But God gives us even more grace to stand against such evil desires. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but favors the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. First step in submitting to God in total obedience is humbleness. In some translations, your Bible may read in verse 7, it says, submit unto the Lord. Other translation goes back to humble, but that word humble means to hand it over to God and think of ourselves lower than God. It basically in redneck terms is saying take a look in the mirror and see who you are and then remember you're not God. How many of us get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say well God let me tell you what I'm going to do today. 
No, we get up in the morning and say, God, what do you want me to do today? First step in obedience and submitting is we have to humble ourselves. There's a country song came out. I should have had them sing it this month. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble. Oh, Lord, it is hard to be humble. I look around this building and I see some guys and I see myself in the mirror thinking, man, it is hard to be humble sometimes. Has anybody ever treated you like, you know what? I guess I can say crappeth in here, right? Anybody ever treated you like crappeth and, and, and you just said, man, I deserve that? No. We're not, we don't go to that person in humility. We say, man, who are you to be talking to me that way? How many times do we do that to God? Because we don't humble ourselves at the feet of the Creator. First step in obedience is humility. Being humble means maybe it's not what I think is important. Maybe it's not what I think needs to happen in my life. Maybe it's not what makes me feel good or puts me in my comfort zone, but it's what my Heavenly Father wants, the guy that sent His only Son to train us to be Christ-like. Maybe it's not about you. Maybe it's about God. James is telling us we need to fall in line. You see that word submit in some of the other translations comes from a Greek military word. The word submit, when it's used in the New Testament, comes from a military word that simply means this, to fall in line. You remember your teachers ever telling you, get in line! Line up! God's telling us in his word right here is, guys, get in line with my word. You see, submission says that we'll humble ourselves, but it also, he goes on to tell us, that we need to resist the devil. You see, what I believe James is talking about here is we need to be aware of our surroundings. We need to be aware of what's going into our mind. We need to be aware of the things that we're reading and watching and listening to. We need to be aware of the people we're hanging out with. You see, sometimes we get around those situations and God's will is the last thing on our minds. It's about making that other group feel good. It's about our pride and our ego of being a part of a group instead of being bold enough and daring to obey God enough to say, you know what, what they're doing, what they're listening to, what I'm watching, what I've got on the radio, what I've got in my hand is not bring, being pleasing to my Father. So obedience says that we'll resist the devil. In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter is preaching almost the exact same message that James is preaching. He starts out and he says, God opposes the proud but favors the humble. And then he says, humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and at the right time he will lift you up in honor and give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. And then verse 8, he says, stay alert. And I've told you all this over the last few weeks. One of the things we overlook the most in this Bible is punctuation. Now, I absolutely hated grammar, English, all that stuff in school. If it had not been for a couple of girlfriends and a teacher that liked me, I would not have gotten through high school. I would have failed English and grammar and all that stuff. I didn't understand the need to separate sentences and punctuate in the right place. It's like, that, that's just stupid to me. I don't understand it. Just, just talk. But... What we've got to understand in God's Word that punctuation is important. Peter says, stay alert. And there's an exclamation point up there. You see what he's doing is, is he is shouting in your ear and he says, hey, hey, quit thinking about lunch. Cowboys are probably going to lose today. I don't even know if they're playing today because I don't watch football. <laughs> but, but I'm telling you, Pay attention right now. Stay alert. Because what I'm about to tell you is important. He says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. Because he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Most of us stop right there and think, man, my, my mother-in-law, I loved her to death. But the booger man was behind every shrub in the backseat of her car 
behind every closet. She lived her life in such fear that everything was locked up. She would go to the car to go to the grocery store, unlock it, get in. Remember, she forgot her purse. Get out of the car, lock it back, unlock the house, get her purse, and come back. I'm talking about 45 seconds. Uh, here from that box to the deal was how close her car was. The booger man was going to get her. We read that verse all the time, and, and we stop right there and say, Whoo, I better watch out for that devil. Where is he? But we don't read the rest of it when he says, Stand firm against him. Stand firm against him. If you're sitting in here today and you remember a time you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the same spirit, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in you. And you have the ability from our Father to stand firm. The problem is we buy into his lie and we get soft. He says, stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Be strong in your faith. I want to stop there for just a second because as we're talking about this daring to obey, we've talked about knowing God's Word and what, how important it is to study God's Word, to pray to God, to understand God's Word. But guys, standing, understanding and knowledge are not going to protect you. Faith is what's going to protect you. Faith is what's going to give you the ability to submit. Faith is the part that's going to give you the ability. This morning I was reading a text message from a friend of mine, a cowboy pastor out in Canyon, Texas. And some of you will understand this. That moment when you've got your left foot in the stirrup and your right foot is kind of hopping, you're at that point right before you lift your right foot and swing that leg over a horse. You see, as soon as that right foot leaves the ground... You have submitted to that horse. And in my case, I hope he does not buck. For some of you in here, you know he's going to. When Jeremy's breaking colts years ago, he understands what I'm talking about. There's that point where you do that little hop as they're moving, and that right foot is still just kind of dragging a little bit. But the minute that foot leaves and swings over the saddle, you're all in, buddy. You're all in. You see, God's telling us right here is quit hopping on the ground. Because some of us have our left foot in the stirrup. We're riding with Jesus, and man, you're looking, thinking, oh, this is great, I'm being obedient to God. I, I, I know his word, I understand his word, and I got my left foot in there. But you're still hopping on that right foot because you're afraid to swing that right leg over and completely ride with him. What he's telling us this morning is, guys, swing a leg over. Completely Submit. And we do that by humbling ourselves and by resisting the devil. James goes on to tell us, he says, wash your hands and purify your hearts. Wash your hands and purify your hearts. That's been my prayer for several years now. Lord, wash my hands and give me a clean heart. Because so many times we come to church, we come to a place and the outside gets clean. Man, we feel good for a little while, but we never have purified our hearts. We've always been hopping on that right leg saying, God, I'll give you everything. I'll give you my money. I'll give you my job. I'll give you my family. Lord, Lord, I, I give you my health. But Lord, I just got to hang on to my heart because I'm just not sure I'm ready to give you all of my thoughts all of my desires and all of my wants. Matthew 23, 25, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. He says, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and indulgence. James is preaching Jesus' message right here. He says, guys, humble yourselves. Flee from sin. And guys, clean up the inside and the outside. Last week we talked about understanding is three things. It's repentance. It's that point where you're headed one direction and you hit a spot and you turn 
and you go the other direction and start following God, it's that point where you understand God's grace that nothing you can ever do. I don't care how many times you come to ride in the River Cowboy Church. I don't care how many times you pick up your Bible and read it, how many times you get on your knees and pray, but until you come to a point and say, God, I am messed up, but you are perfect, and you are holy, and you sent Jesus to die for me, we're never going to fully submit to the will of God. I, like everyone else in this building, struggle with cleaning up the inside. Because I'm telling you, cleaning up the outside is easy. Cleaning up the inside means that nobody else can affect what's going on but me. None of y'all in here can control what I think, what my heart says. I control that. And I have to give that to the Lord. I have to say, God, I submit to you. This morning, maybe God's finally turned you out of whatever pen you're in. And you're running for the water or the feed or whatever it is. And he's blowing the whistle. He's saying, come back. Be obedient to me. Do you know him? Do you understand him? Are you willing to submit to him and give him everything. Just like we've talked about before, Texas Hold'em table. You're sitting there. You hold the cards. Chips are in your court. You have to make a decision. Am I going to go all in for Jesus Christ today? I dare you. I dare you to be obedient to him. And it starts with knowing him, understanding him, and submitting to him. We submit to a God that loves you, a God that desires the best for you. Not wealth, not perfect health, but a future and a hope. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. God, I thank you that you're a God of second chances. God, that you're a God that that loves us even in our sin, just as we are right now. God, you love us. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. Father, thank you for your grace. Lord, for having mercy when we don't deserve it. Father, thank you for your word this morning and through examples of Arabian horses, of how we need to control what we put into our minds, what we, that we need to control who we obey. God, that we need clarity, that we can see with your eyes, hear with your ears, and speak boldly the words you put in our heart. Father, as a family, I know others in this family are joining me and praying for those in this family, those in this group, that have not accepted you as Lord and Savior. Father, today I pray you would show them that you are a God of courage and that you have given them the ability to step boldly before your throne and confess their sins to you. Father, we love you. Father, I thank you for your amazing grace. Lord, I thank you for the picture of, of these two baptisms today, of what it means and what it represents of how we die to self and live through you. Father, thank you for this family. Thank you for allowing Kim and I to be a part of it. Lord, I pray that as we continue to mature and grow together, God, that each and every day we wouldn't be satisfied. We would be striving to be obedient. Father, thank you for saving a messed up sinner like me. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.